Good afternoon, grade 12 learners, educators and viewers. My name is Noe Monto. I welcome you all to the last section of our revision lesson, which is human evolution. Without any waste of time, let us start. Where do we belong as humans? We belong to the kingdom Animalia, Phylum Caudata, class Mammals, Order Primates, Family Hominidae, Genus Homo, Species Sapie. Coming to how we should write scientific names. So here I'm having a Homo sapien as an example of a scientific name. So we need to know that any scientific name has two parts. It has the first part, which is called the genus. Plural is the, is the genera. It starts with a capital letter. So in that example of a Homo sapien, Homo, it's a genus. So the second part of a name, it's a species. It starts with a small letter. In the very same example, a sapien, it's an example of a species. So after you have written this scientific name, you need to underline it. The family hominidae. This family is very important. Examiners like to ask questions on it. The family hominidae or hominidae includes orangutans, gorilla, chimpanzees, modern humans. It is further divided into the hominids and the hominin tribes or subfamilies. I'll start first with the hominid. It is the group consisting of the modern humans, chimpanzees, gorilla, orangutans, plus all their extinct ancestors. I mean that it includes all the members of the family hominidae. Coming to the hominin. It is a group consisting of the modern humans, extinct human species, such as the Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and Ardipithecus. Here, a modern human can be classified as a hominid and again as a hominin. But a chimpanzee or a gorilla or an or orangutan cannot be classified as a hominin. It is only classified as a hominid. Phylogenetic tree. What is a phylogenetic tree? It is a diagram that shows relationships among species or organisms. So before we can interpret a phylogenetic tree, we need to know its parts. So it has a root. So here we have the root. It represents the oldest common ancestor. So here we have the oldest common ancestor. So the second part of a phylogenetic tree, it's a node or a branching point. So this is a node or a branching point, a node 
or a branching point. So a node or a branching point represents a common ancestor or speciation. Another part, we have the branch tips. It's the tip of a branch. It represents the descendants. Normally here we write the names of the species at the tips. The last part, it's a branch. So this is a branch. It is called ancestral branch. And then here again we have a branch. It is called the, the branch of the descendants. So a branch represents history shared by a common ancestor and its descendants. So we need to know that if a branch is long, it means that particular species there lived long. But if a branch is short, it means a species didn't live long. So when you are asked to construct a phylogenetic tree of your family members, that includes your maternal grandmother, your mother, your brother, or your sister, and you, you will find that you are closely related or look more similar to your brother or sister because of the recent common ancestor that you share who is your mother. And you'll have certain little features that you share in common with your maternal grandmother, who is the oldest a common ancestor. And you include your aunts and your cousins. You'll still look closely related to your sibling because of the recent common ancestor, your mother, and least related to your cousins because you don't share the recent common ancestor with them. However, there will be those least features that you share in common as a result of the oldest common ancestor, your grandmother, that you all share in common or you came from. So the exam guideline says we need to interpret the phylogenetic tree of the family hominidae. So this is the phylogenetic tree of the family hominidae. So it has this part which is called the root. So this is the tip of a root. It represents the oldest common ancestor. And then here we are having a node. So now this node represents speciation, which is underwent by this co uh, oldest common ancestor. So here the oldest common ancestor on this line formed the gibbons. But here on this line, it gave rise to the orangutans, the gorilla, the chimpanzees, and the humans. So do you still remember I said this part represents a common ancestor or the formation of a new species? So now in this phylogenetic tree, this common ancestor, the oldest common ancestor, lived up until here. And then from there, here, the orangutans evolved. So now this part represents a common ancestor of the orangutans. And then this line represents a history which is, which is shared by these common ancestor and the descendants, which are the orangutans. Here again, we have a branching point, a common ancestor. But just have a look here. We are having that branching point or a node. OK? So now from this branching point or from this node, two species 
we have formed, the chimpanzees, and the modern humans. So can you see that the chimpanzees and the modern humans, they share a recent common ancestor. So modern humans didn't evolve from the chimpanzees. Had modern humans evolved from the chimpanzees, the chimpanzees would have long been extinct. So what they do, they just share a common ancestor. So if organisms share a common ancestor, then there are certain characteristics that they share in common. And when you look at all these organisms or species, they are different. So mean that here we have different species. So if species are different, then it means there are certain characteristics that make them to look different. So we'll start first with the characteristics that we share in common with the African apes. So the first characteristic that we have here is large brain. But here we need to know that a modern human has a larger brain compared to the other primates. All of us, we have eyes in front. We have free rotating arms. We have long upper arms, rotation around the elbow joints, bare fingertips or nails instead of, of claws to sense touch. We all have opposable thumb for power grip. We, have, we all have upright posture for better view of the environment. Other characteristics that we share in common, which are not listed here, and they are also important. We all have eyes with cones for color vision, binocular vision, meaning that we are able to look at an object with our two eyes. Stereoscopic vision. Here we are able to look at an object in totality. We look at it cons co uh, considering its length, width, and height. We all have five fingers per hand, five toes per foot, reduced olfactory brain centers, mean that all the centers of the brain which deal with smell, they are reduced. And brain centers that process information from hands and, uh, 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 and eyes are enlarged. We have two teeth. Please don't say the mammary glands here. Be specific and say the teeth. Because it is from a mammary gland where we get the teeth. So now there are those organisms from the mammary glands which have more than two teeth. Just like for a cow, an example. It has more than uh, two teeth. A teeth is that part where the milk comes from. Sexual dimorphism, where males and females are clearly distinguished. Coming to the differences between humans and African apes. Humans have large, uh, large cranium that houses large brain. Large cranium to house large brain. African apes, small cranium to house small brain. Brow ridges of humans are not well developed. So our brow ridges are not well developed, but when we go to the brow ridges of the African apes, they are well developed. Coming to the spine, our spine is more curved or S-shaped. That one of an African ape, less curved and C-shaped. I'll show you this later on. 
pelvic giddy, short and wide. African apes, long and narrow. Here, if we are asked to mention how the pelvic giddy of a modern human is, or that one of an African ape, don't just say short and leave out white. This short goes hand in hand with white. The same applies here. Coming to the canines, we have small canines and then they have uh, large canines. Small and semicircular palate, their palate is long and rectangular or U shaped. Coming to the jaws, our jaws are small and their jaws are large. Our jaws, again, are less protruding. There's no protrusion here. Or we say they are less prognathous. African apes, the jaws are more protruding. Or they are more prognathous. Coming to the cranial ridge. So we don't have any cranial ridge here. But when you look at an African ape, it has the cranial ridge. There is a bump here. Coming to the foramen magnum, uh, magnum. So the foramen magnum of a modern human is in a more forward position. And that one of an African ape is in a backward position. So if we are asked to list these differences, please make use of the English words which are used here if you want to get more marks. Don't make use of your own English words. Just like, uh, for instance, you can say our brow ridges are not there, but here you say brow ridges are, are, are there. No, you'll not get a mark for saying that. You need to say that our brow ridges are not well developed, and here the brow ridges are well developed. Coming to bipedalism. Walking on two legs. We walk on two legs. So what are the factors which cause bipedalism? So these are the factors which cause bipedalism. The foramen magnum, which is in a more forward position. For the vertebral column to enter the skull vertically, the pelvic gidlil. So now this is a pelvic gidlil of a modern human. It is short and wide. Why? So as to support the upper body weight. The spine, our spine is more curved or S-shaped. Why? So as to absorb shock or allow flexible movement or to provide support. Now let us quickly have a look at the differences between bipedalism and quadrupedalism. So in human evolution, many things are just repeating themselves, guys. So I'll start first with the foramen magnum. So now, as I've said, the foramen magnum of a modern human is in a more forward position, so as to allow the spinal cord to enter here. And then when we move to an African ape, the foramen magnum is in a more backward position. 
come into the pelvic giddles. So the pelvic giddle of a chimpanzee is long. Why? So as to carry the body weight on the forelimbs. But when it comes to, modern, to, a, to a modern human, the pelvic giddle, as I've just said, it is short and wide, so as to carry the weight of the upper body. So now these are the differences that I've just uh, talked about. Coming to the advantages of bipedalism. These advantages, guys, you don't have to cram them. So in order for you to mention them, if they are asked, just ask yourself this question. What would happen to me if I was working on four legs or if I was grueling? Would my hands be, be free to carry foods, tools, and babies? Will I have a better view of my environment? Will I be able to move from place to place? Will I be able to display my sexual organs so as to attract a member of the opposite sex? Then you will say no. So now that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on two legs, so it means my hands become free for carrying foods, tools, and babies. I have a better view, a, a, a better view of the surroundings in search of food and predators. Movement from place to place becomes more efficient. And an organism is, is able to display the sexual organs as a part of courtship. So here I have a question, which is based on the skulls of the two primates, skull one and skull two. Skull one is that one of a chimpanzee to a modern human. So now the question says, give two, tabulate three observable differences between skull one and skull two that show trends in human evolution. If you are asked such a question, guys, please make mention the differences that you can see. Just like for instance, when I look at the two skulls, I'm able to see the cranium. Here the cranium is small, here the cranium is large. I'm able to see the brow ridges. Here they are pronounced, here they are not uh, pronounced. I'm able again to see a sloping face. Here I'm able to see a flat face. The jaws which are large, jaws which are small, jaws which are protruding, jaws which are not protruding. Large canine, small canine. Not well developed chin. The chin here is well developed. The second question, give four characteristics of the upper limbs that humans share with other primates. This question here is specific. It doesn't say mention the characteristics that humans share with other primates. So now these characteristics, they pertain only to the upper limbs. So here you need to mention characteristics such as Rotation around the elbow joint, rotation around the wrist, opposable thumb, five fingers per hand, you name them. And then if we are asked to explain how an increase in the cranial volume is related to intelligence, here you need to say large cranial, cranial volume houses large brain. Large brain is made up of more brain cells. So these more brain cells suggest, they suggest intelligence. So now here we have the answers. Coming to the lines of evidence that support the idea of, a com of common ancestors for the living hominids, including the humans. can see that here 
we have a common ancestor. So the name of these common ancestor from all these species came, came from is not mentioned. So scientists are still looking for a common ancestor of all the species, including the modern humans and the modern chimpanzees. Again, we need to know that there is a common ancestor for all the hominins. Homo erectus, Paranthropus bosei, Paranthropus robustus, Paranthropus, these uh, Paranthropus species, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, uh, Anamisia, Australopithecus afarensis. They, 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 they also have a common ancestor. And we don't know who that common ancestor is. Scientists are still searching for that. But what they do say, they say that there is a common ancestor. As you can see from this, uh, from this diagram. And what they are saying is supported by evidence. So the first evidence that we have is the fossil evidence. So fossils which were discovered is the fossil of Ardipithecus ramidius. This is how it looked like before, uh, when it was still an organism. It was discovered by Tim White. Fossil of Lucy, this is how it looked like. It was discovered by Donald Johnson. Fossil of Darwin Child, this is how it looked like. It was discovered by Raymond, by, by Raymond Dad. Fossil of Mrs. Pless, discovered by Robert Broom. This is how Mrs. Pless looked like. Fossil of Little Foot, discovered by Rontlack. A fossil of Sidiba, discovered by Lee Beggar. This is how he looked like. Fossils, fossil of Homo habilis, discovered by Louis and Mary Leek. This is a fossil, this is how it looked like. Fossil of Homo uh, erectus, this is how it looked, uh, this, uh, this is the fossil of Homo erectus. This is how it looked like. It was covered by, it was discovered by Eugene Du Bois. Here we are having a fossil of a Homo sapien, the earlier Homo sapien. It was discovered by, by Andre Kaiser and many scientists around the world. Here I took the skulls of the two fossils, a fossil of Ardipithecus and modern human. So let us try to look at the change in the characteristics of the skulls as we move from ape-like being, Ardipithecus, to modern humans. So now when you look here, Ardi has a small cranium, Modern human, large cranium. Face, it's large. Here the face is small. The face is sloping. The face is flat. Large teeth, just have a look at them. And then here, the teeth are small. Look at the brow ridges. Brow ridges are, are pronounced. In fact, they are heavily pronounced. But here, the brow ridges are less pronounced. The jaws are large. Jaws are small. So here I have a table that shows the characteristics of different organisms as obtained from a study of their fossil. Good people, this is just a repetition of what I talked about.
But in what I, I discussed, I didn't talk about when the organism existed, fossil site. So in the exam, you can be given this table. And then from this table, you can um, be asked, or you could be asked to mention three Australopithecus fossils found in Africa. E.g. Downchild, Littlefoot, Mrs. Pless, and Karabo, or A. Sidiba. Not just Sidiba. A for Australopithecus. Say Australopithecus Sidiba or A. Sidiba. Or you could be asked uh, to mention a, a transitional fossil from this table. So you need to know that a transitional fossil is a Sidiba or Garabo because it has features of the Homo and the Australopithecus. Or you could be asked to complete this table by writing down the missing weights. So as I've said, in human evolution, the information repeats itself. So here we have changes in characteristics as we move from earlier apes, like being to modern humans. I have also talked about those changes, but here we have the complete skeletons. So the changes that we, that we see from here to here is that the cranium here is small, here large, the neck is short, here it's large. The chin here is well developed, here is poorly developed. And then when it comes to the chest, the chest is funnel shaped, this one is barrel shaped. Lungs. I'm sorry, coming to the arms, can you see that the arms here are long? Here, the arms are not that long, they're a little bit shorter. And then, when it comes to the lower limbs, they are short. Here, the lower limbs are long. The thumb here, is not in line with the other fingers, but here it is in line, you can't even see it. Here, the big toe, again, it is not in line with the other toes, but here it is in line. Look at the hands, here they are kept, here they are not kept. So now this information again, it's a repetition. So again, here we're having a, a, an information, which is still a, a, a repetition, but it is more detailed. It has the significance of the different characteristics. This question was once an essay in one of the question papers. So now the information here is very important. Make it a point that you read it. The second evidence to support the idea of a common ancestor is genetic evidence. An example here is a mitochondrial DNA. Don't say the evidence is mitochondrial DNA. You are not going to get the mark. Say it is genetic. So what is it that we need to know about this mitochondrial DNA? So we need to know that the mitochondria is found in the body of a sperm. And then this mitochondria contains mitochondrial DNA. Again, the mitochondria is found in the cytoplasm of an ovum or an egg cell. And they also contain mitochondrial DNA.
So mitochondrial DNA, guys, is transferred by an egg cell during fertilization from the mother to her offspring, which are her sons and daughters. So now let us see what happened here. So we have the egg cell with its mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA inside. We have a sperm, mitochondria, which are found here in the body, and then head, nuclear DNA, and then here again we still have nuclear DNA. So now during fertilization, what is going to happen is that this nuclear DNA will fuse with this nuclear DNA. So can you see that both the sperm and the egg, they contribute towards the nuclear DNA of the zygote. But here, we only have the mitochondria of an egg. So it is the mitochondria of the mother. The mitochondria of the, of the sperm are not here because the body together with the tail, they, they don't enter an ovum during fertilization. They remain behind. So here we need to know that this mitochondria, which is inherited from mothers to sons and daughters, when it is analyzed, it, sh it shows that the oldest female ancestors are located or were located in Africa, and that all humans descended from her. The second evidence is cultural evidence, tool making. So here we need to know that the Dan hominids would make use of the stones and wood to make knives, blades, axes, the rings, and the ornaments. So now all these are cultural evidence which was found by scientists as they were searching for a common ancestor. Coming to the out of Africa hypothesis, it says all modern humans or homo sapiens originated in Africa and migrated to other parts of the world. Please don't say all humans originated in Africa. Be specific and say all modern humans originated in Africa and migrated to the other parts of the world. Here we need to know that the Homo sapiens, they didn't originate in the other parts of the world and migrated from there. They, or, they, they originate here, they originated here, and then from there, they went to the different parts of the world. So, what is the evidence to support what I've just said? We have genetic evidence. An example is mitochondrial DNA. This is still a repetition of what we did. The second evidence is the fossil evidence. So this information, again, it's a repetition of what I did with you when I was showing you uh, the fossil evidence. Remember, I did uh, show you the fossil evidence. All these evidence.
appears here again. But here, the information such as people who discovered the fossils, fossil sites, and the characteristics are not included here. But know that the information is still the same. So how do you go about discussing the fossil evidence as evidence for the out of Africa hypothesis? You need to say fossils of Ardipithecus were found in Africa only. This only is important. It has to be included. Fossils of Australopithecus were found in Africa only. Fossils of Homo habilis were found in Africa only. The oldest fossils of the Homo erectus were found in Africa, while the younger fossils were found in the other parts of the world. Why? Why were the younger fossils found in the other parts of the world? Because the Homo erectus were able to move, so they could move from one place to another. And the oldest fossils of the Homo sapiens were found in Africa. So now this information which is provided here implies or suggests that the modern humans, they developed or they originated here in Africa. Coming to the timeline for the existence of different species of the genus Homo. So now this information again, it's a repetition. So, but what is important here, we need to know when the different species of the Homo first appeared on Earth, when did they disappear or get extinct, how long did they live, and what did they do on Earth? and the significant features to show the difference amongst them. Questions on timeline could be asked in a form of a graph or a table. In the trial exam that you wrote, you were asked to draw a table that has three different species of the genus Homo and their, their brain capacities in the correct order. Last but not least, the interpretation of a phylogenetic tree proposed by different scientists showing the possible evolutionary relationship as it applies to the hominid evolution. So here we're having a phylogenetic tree of the hominids, modern human, and its extinct ancestors. So let me quickly go to the questions because I did show you how to interpret it. The first question here says, what is the name given to the type of diagram above? It's a phylogenetic tree. How many of each of the following are represented in the diagram, the genera? Remember I said a genus starts with a capital letter. So now let us count. We have one. If a, or if a genus repeats itself, then you count it as one. So it's one, two, I can only see two. Come into the species. Do you still remember I said it starts with a small letter? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So species, we have seven. Explain why A. robustus and A. bosei are more closely related than A. bosei and A. afarensis. The two are closely related because they share a more recent common ancestor. Which of the hominids in the diagram above is considered to have been the first to use tools? Homo habilis. 
Name two Australopithecus fossils found in Africa. You can say A. Sidiba or Garabo, Darwin Child, Littlefoot. And Mrs. Bless. The last question, explain how the location and the age of the homo fossils are used as evidence for the out of Africa hypothesis. Here we need to talk about the homo fossils only. So how must you answer this question? So here you need to say the oldest fossils of the Homo erectus were found in Africa, while the younger fossils migrated to the other parts of the world. All these fossils of the Homo habilis were found here. All these fossils of the Homo sapiens were also found here. Let me check the answers here. The oldest fossils of the Homo, Homo habilis or Homo erectus are found only in Africa. The younger fossils of the Homo, Homo erectus were found in Africa and other parts of the world. So now this implies that the earliest Homo sapiens evolved in Africa. So we have come to the end of our revision. Thank you so much for listening.